turn there with me, please. Most of us that you may not know the exact chapter, but when we begin to read, it's a very familiar story that most of us, if not all of us, will be reminded of. But I want to go down to the latter part, or really it's the midsection of of this entire story that starts at verse 1 and kind of culminates there in verse 44. But I want to go to the midsection of that, and I'm going to be reading verses 32, 33, 34, and 35. John chapter 11, verse 32, down to and through verse 35. Everybody have it? All right. John, the gospel of John, chapter 11, verse 32, down to and through verse 35. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet saying unto him, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother had not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled, and said, Where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. You may be seated. I I don't know how you are. When I go through things, I know the relevancy of the word of God. And I turn to the word of God. And I ask God to speak to me through his word. And that's why it's good to know his word. Uh, There's times he can direct you to something that maybe you weren't even thinking about. And then other times he can give you and refresh something in your mind. But I, I, I don't want this to be about us today. But if you will allow me, I want to talk a little bit this morning when when the last tear falls, when the last tear falls. They had to draw the week out for family members to get here, and so it kind of pushed us up close to today. And in the middle of it, I wasn't going to say or do anything in the funeral. And, and we kind of shifted gears. And I had a, a pretty large part in it after all. And so I was busy with that. And after the funeral and the meal, we came home. And before the family tried to get together one last time, and they did last night, because they hadn't been all together in such a long time, that after the funeral, they we came back and everybody else tried to get a nap. And I said, Lord, I got to have something to say for Sunday morning. I got to preach. I, and Lord, I, I don't even know. I, I flipped through. You know, when you've been a minister so long, there's messages you've preached and I just look, and you, I couldn't find any emotional fire anywhere. And as preachers say, you know, they were so dry that even the Lord himself couldn't preach them, let alone me. And so I, I, I just, I was tired, and I just sat at my desk, and I was looking, gazing at nothing, just kind of looking into the walls. And finally, I just put my arm down on my desk, and I laid my head down. And I said, Lord, I am so tired. What, what, what can I say? What, what can I say? And I lay there for quite a while and trying to think and really just my mind was in neutral. But all of a sudden, this thought just came to my mind. 
the last tear will fall. The last tear will fall. And immediately there was this passage of scripture that came to my mind. I opened my Bible and I wanted to read it one more time. And as I read it one more time, there were were things that I'm sure that we've all seen and probably preached on, but uh, it, it, it was just so refreshing to me that that when the last tear falls, you will notice in this passage that I've chosen to read and my focus was upon this that you know what we as Christians are not going to be exempted from tears and the reason for that when God made us emotionally and uh, you know he made us to be able to be capable of experiencing good emotions but now because of sin uh, we've been introduced to bad and negative emotions that, that <coughs> excuse me, that hinder us and, and pull us down. And so it's very natural to cry. It's very natural uh, to have a meltdown sometime uh, if you really care and you really love and you're really touched by the situation that you may be going through. But you'll notice in this passage that it says that Mary wept and then the Jews that were there to comfort, they wept. And then the Bible says Jesus wept. There's very few times that it's referenced that Jesus wept, but they're all very interesting times to glean from and gain from, but but here, that is when you have sisters crying. That's one thing. When you have the sad crying, the Jews, uh, that's something else too. But when you have the Savior weeping, there's something very special and something very unique and something very hardcore in the very core of one's soul that is going on. And in the midst of the tears, there will be a last tear one of these days. There will be a last tear even in what you're going through right now. And uh, it will not affect you as much as it does today. As your heart is breaking, and I'm not just talking about losing a loved one. Uh, I'm not talking about losing a best friend, but whatever you may be going through, this is not just tears about losing a loved one, but you can receive a call about yourself, your health, or a, a, another situation, and your life is changed instantaneously. And the tears begin to fall. And the Bible speaks much about tears. The Bible talks about much about weeping, crying, tears, a situation, an event that not only touches you, but it influences you and it affects you to the very core of your soul. And even without even thinking about it, and when maybe you want it to happen, the least, the tears, the floodgates are just opened up of your eyes and tears, and you weep and you cry. And I know that we live in a generation where, you know, men don't cry, and individuals, if you're strong, uh, you don't cry. But listen to me, church. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. And this is not my message. A lot will try to explain some of that away because that he groaned in his spirit and he was troubled and, and making it to mean something else. But, but, but you cannot convince me that Jesus 
was not saddened by all of the sadness that was surrounded what was going on that day. The Bible not only talks a lot about tears, but this book is full of individuals that experienced situations and where they wept intently. The Bible, you can find experiences where people wept because they were sad. Things just didn't work out the way they felt they would. They're a little disappointed and saddened by the chain of events culminated by the final event. They're sad. Sometimes we're sad in conjunction with that because of separation. Individuals that go through a divorce of separation, They're, they cry, they weep, those especially that wanted to make it work. And it's I, I, that's one that I don't imagine, I cannot imagine, and I hope I never have to imagine, and I'm sure that I won't. But nonetheless, separation, sometimes not divorce, but it's by death that you lose a loved one and you cry. And it has nothing to do with being weak in your spiritual relationship and, and walk with God. It simply means that you had a very close and tremendous relationship with that person. And sure, you're glad they're not suffering. Sure, you're glad that, that they're in the arms of the Lord. And sure, you're glad... But when day after day after day after day you have talked to them and, and enjoyed their presence through thick and thin and all of a sudden the separation is, is final and sure, you are going to miss that individual and that separation is going to cause you to cry. Sometimes it's not divorce or death, but it's distance we did fine yesterday till Ryan and Shantae went home and the, I know they're only three and a half hours away I understand that I know some of your children are way farther away and I understand all of that but there's something about in an emotional time and Individuals you're close to, no, they're not divorced, they're not uh, dead, but there's just distance between you, and you're saddened by that. You cry. We cry because of sadness and separation. Sometimes it's suffering. receive bad news physically and when you collect yourself just trying to absorb that even though you may not be hurting physically you break down and you cry and you cry from other times for that when the pain becomes severe of that we cry because of seclusion we're lonely we're by ourselves we feel like nobody understands nobody cares sometimes we weep and we cry because of sympathy it isn't us that's hurting or suffering or receive bad news. In fact, we're doing fine. But we cry because we see others, our brother, our sister, that's suffering, that's sad, that's separated. And we weep because of sympathy. But where I've come to with this message 
and all of these things rolling around in this little mind of mine when the last tear drops when the last tear falls what I felt that I was thinking or the Lord dropped into my heart was simply this there will come a time when that last tear will fall and maybe even here on this earth where, as I said, it does not affect you as it does. And time does heal and, and the Lord helps. But it's going to be one of two ways. And here's what I'm looking at, that, that when the last tear falls, what will be our spiritual state? What will be my emotional state? Do you know some people don't cry because they disconnect? Some people, they say, you know what? The last tear has fallen that I'll ever cry is because I don't care anymore. The Lord's not been faithful. This thing that you talk about is not real. It's not genuine. And so I don't care anymore. And so you'll never see another tear come out of my eye. And there's people like that. Or when the last tear falls, that when we have gone through that situation, that the Lord in his power, his grace, his mercy, and his love, and most of all his overwhelming comfort by the Holy Spirit, that, that even in the midst of the tears we know and we sense him and we know that he's there. But when the last tear falls and our eyes are cleared and not foggy anymore and trying to see through the midst of the tears, we can see the evidence of God and his faithfulness and his power and his glory and what I'm simply saying that when the last tear falls yeah we know that ultimately in heaven but I want to encourage you today that whatever you're going through that have caused you a fountain and rivers of tears there will come a time when this too will pass and you will come out on the other side and the sun will shine again and you will see the goodness of the Lord. When the last tear Oh, that doesn't mean that somewhere in the future there's times that I, I'm not even thinking about anything and my mom or my dad or my brother will come to my mind and sure, you're saddened by that and maybe a tear will slip out. But nonetheless, I'm talking about that finalization when God just lifts you above the shadows and above the tears, and when that last tear falls. <clears throat> Can I just give you some, some points here that as I went through, and I'm not going to linger real long, but when you come out on the other side that we this too will pass, this crying, there will be a last tear. I like that psalm. And we all know it in Psalm 30 and verse 5 that weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning when the last tear falls. Hallelujah. When that joy is restored in that sense that we want it and we want to sense it. And we want to feel it. When the last tear falls, you will be able to sense and to see and to know the abiding of his presence. In this story, there's much that is made of 
Jesus, if you would have been here, we let you know two days ago and you didn't come and uh, Mary, uh, Martha, first of all, and then Mary later, uh, Jesus, if you'd have been here. And you see, these girls, they were feeling in their heart that when they needed the Lord the most, that he deserted them the most. That when they needed him the most, he was there the least. And Lord, that when we're going through this, the loss of our brother or whatever you're going through, Lord, when I need you the most, it seems that, you know, and, and so in when the tears are flowing like a river, we say, where are you, Lord? Where are you, God? Where are you, Jesus? Where are you when the tears are flowing up? But let me tell you something, that when the last tear drops and you're able to see clearly again, you'll be able to know that he was there with you every step of the way. And in retrospect, you can look back and you can see where he carried you and where he loved you and where he was with you, maybe in the shadows uh, maybe his presence wasn't as evident and pronounced uh, as it was in other times. But ah, uh, when the last tear falls, you know that you were in his loving bosom the entire time. His abiding presence. His abiding presence. You'll also become keenly aware when the last tear falls of the absoluteness of his preeminence. The certainty that God is preeminent. That is, that God is bigger than anything I'll ever face. Anything that ever causes me to shed a tear. Anything that causes me to shed a river of tears. That God is preeminent. I'm simply saying that God is in control. And if you'll notice in, the story, in this story along with the fact of, Lord, where were you and where are you? There was also the question, Jesus, what are you doing? Why aren't you here? Why did you do it that way? Why, why have you done it that way? And how many of us in the midst of the tears, we have said, God, where are you? And Lord, what under this sun are you trying to achieve? Are you trying to kill me? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't. I don't see how the puzzle's going to fit together. And the timing couldn't be worse. Lord, what is going on? Why? What are you doing? But you know, once again, when the last tear falls, you'll see the absoluteness of his pre preeminence that God has been in control from the very beginning. And even before you knew of this issue and this situation that you are facing, God knew about it. And God is working it out and God is, is helping you. And we can rest assured that our lives in the hands of the Lord, that when the last tear falls, he is working all things out for our Good. Hallelujah. 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 When the last tear falls, the assurance of his promises. The assurance of his promises. Jesus said, your brother is only sleeping, he'll, he'll live again. Martha said, sure he will in the resurrection. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection. 
I am the resurrection. You see, in the midst of it, when the tears are flowing freely and all we can think about is the situation and a lot of times we become introverted and in looking at our, our own loss and our own situation and our own circumstance, that so many times what happens instead of viewing the problem through the promise we are viewing the promise through the problem. And when you view the problem through the promise, that, uh, you know, it, it becomes, becomes small. But when you view the promise through the problem, that also makes the promise very small. And I'll be honest, I'm not talking about this past week, but my wife and I, we've been through other things of too. There have been times that... That, that, you know, when you go through, you try to stand on the promises, but yet one day leads to another, and, and the days turn to weeks, and the weeks turn to years, and, and seemingly like you still are not seeing it. I'm telling you, church, I know that it's hard. You begin to look at the promises, and instead of having that reassurance and that assurance, you begin to question. And you begin to say, Lord, is that promise for everybody but Rich Gold Eisen? I mean, I see it working out, and I see it being fulfilled in, in other people's lives, but, Lord, it seems like I've been left here and high and dry. And you begin to question the Lord. You begin to question the Word of God. You begin to question the, uh, the promises. But, you see, that's when the tears are flowing like a river. But when the last tear drops, you will see that he is faithful to every one of those promises. You can't see it when your eyes are clouded with tears. But when the last tear falls, you see the assurance of his promise. You see, Martha was trying to interpret this promise with an event. But Jesus said, don't connect the promise with an event, but connect the promise with a person. Because the reliability of the person will determine upon the reliability and the truthfulness of of the promise. And if Jesus says, I am, <laughs> he is, and you are. Did you hear me? When Jesus says, I am, he is, and we are, praise God, we will see the assurance of that we're not basing our faith upon some event or it's going to turn out this way but we have put ourselves in the hands of the Lord and said Lord I am yours and however you work this out it will not only be for my good and some of the other things we've already discussed but you will not come against or fail in any one of your promises there is the assurance God, that it is true. Can I give you a couple more? <laughs> when the last tear falls, you see the abiding of his presence. He's been there all along. The absoluteness of his preeminence. He's been in control from the start and even before the start. The assurance of his promises. Uh, he's not failed you one time or one of those promises. The audience of his prayers. Did you see what Jesus said when they brought him to the grave site of where Lazarus was? He mentions there in verses 41 and 42, the latter part of verse 41, Father, 
I thank you that you have heard me. The next verse, I know that you hear me always. How many knows that Jesus is our mediator? He's our go-between. You know, it's one thing to have a pastor or to have brothers and sisters and loved ones to put their arm around you. And, and I can't tell you how precious that is and how much that means to you in that moment. And you know as well. But to know that Jesus is praying for you, <laughs> to know that Jesus is your intercessor, he's your uh, mediator, he's your go-between, he's your uh, defense uh, counselor, your defense lawyer, if you will. He is our high priest, the Bible says. And aren't you glad that he is one that when he stands before the heavenly father, and it's not that the heavenly father doesn't want to do it. It's not that at all. Uh, we've talked about this before, but, but just simply saying here, then aren't you glad that we have a counselor that, that the Father always hears his requests? And not only that, but God hears our requests. How many times when the tears are overwhelming, we say, God, where are you? Lord, what are you doing? Are the promises not for me and then we say, Lord, my prayers aren't getting any higher than, than the ceiling. But oh, let me tell you that when the last tear falls, you will come to know that whether you shouted it, whether you cried it, whether in frustration or faith, that as a child of God, when you call upon him, he always hears you. But even more powerful than that, that when your mediator calls upon him and is your stand between, the father always hears and gives him an audience and to hear your case and to resolve your situation. When the last tear falls, the authority of his power. Lazarus, <laughs> come forth. You don't see it. You even doubt it. You even question it. You even cry about it. You shed, uh, you know, I, I was going to mention, but I've already spent a long time, and I, I uh, didn't intend on doing that. But anyway, the Bible talks about the intensity of prayers as well. You read through not just the Psalms, but they'll, they'll say with sore weeping, with bitter weeping with anguish of weeping and uh, even the duration they wept day and night and seemingly no closure or no victory or the last tear is not in sight and 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 all of that but in the midst of all of that we we begin to say god where are you? What are you doing? Are you in control? Are the promises are for me? Do you even hear me when I pray? Uh, what is going on here? But I'm telling you, church, we may even doubt that God is going to do it. But in God's own time, I don't know how he's going to do it. I don't know when he's going to do it. But when the last tear finally drops, you'll be amazed at the authority of his power and what he's able to do and how he's able to do it. And you'll just stand and it'll not only be a testimonial to you, but he'll be a witness to the world of the faithfulness of this God in which those that cry serve. Nona, will you help me this morning one more time? I appreciate your help. This has not been about the Goldeisens this morning. Oh, yeah, partially. But 
we're not the only ones that may have a little bit of hurting going on in our lives. I know you do too. I know there's something that causes the tears to flow in your life. The last point we've all, it's all been about his presence, his promises, his prayers, his power. But the last thing, and you can go ahead and start, Sister Nona, thank you. The answers to all of our problems. The Bible says that one of these days that God is going to wipe away together again, no more separation, no more divorcing, no more death, no more distance, no more sadness, no more sympathy, no more suffering, no more sickness. And all of that, so in the book of Revelation, Revelation 7, 17, Revelation 21 and 4, Will you stand with me? The Lord, that whatever it's been, whatever it is, that, that it caused those river of tears, God is going to dry it forever. And a lot of times we get disappointed when we say, well, we prayed for their healing or we prayed for this and it didn't work out. But you know what, church? If that's the case, we're limiting our vision to down here. You see, our life doesn't stop here. It's way beyond. And so a lot of times the true answer and the true victory and the true overcoming may not come until then, but I'm telling you, it's coming. And there is coming a time when the last tear will fall. Father, I thank you this morning. And Lord, I don't know what Others may be hurting some. I look at faces and I think that I know what is partially going on in their lives because they have shared. But others, Lord, I may not even have a clue. <coughs> but I know that you do. And you know you've seen those tears. Lord, you have wept with us sometimes. And it's not that it's taken you by surprise or you didn't see it coming. But Lord, you truly are touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hey, you know what? Whatever your need is today, if you'd like to just take a moment and stand around this altar, I'd love to have you. I, I'm going to go down there, and I'd love to have you to join me. And I just want you to pray, and I, I want you to ask God, and don't be ashamed of those tears, because the Lord is going to minister. One of these days, you're going to come out of it on the other side. And there will be joy in the morning. Morning to John chapter 7. And, uh, you know, there's even I've been here a little over five years. Seem like every passage I turn to, I think, well, you know, we've talked about this or we've talked about that and we've uh, uh, this. But I, I want to do it in a little kind of a new way here. Uh, John chapter 7. And you'll notice that I have a spigot, uh, outside spigot here. And I've got a hose that is there. Let's see, do I have it hooked up yet? I do have it hooked up. But if you'll notice, the end of the hose is there. 
Is there any water coming out? Where'd the flow go? Where'd the flow go? (laughs) Where did the flow go? John chapter 7 in verse 37. And we're going to read verses 38 or verse 38 as well and verse 39. Everybody have it? John chapter 7 verse 37, 38 and 39. Here we go, John 7, 37. In the last day, comma, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying. And when the Bible said that he cried, it literally means that. That at the top of his lungs, he he cried, and many times it'll say with a, with a loud voice, but not necessarily here, but, but, but that he did cry, say, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of what? Living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. That simply means he had not gone back to heaven yet. All right? So I want to ask again, where did the flow go? You may be seated. The Bible makes it very clear in several scriptures. And let me just give you a sampling of a couple of them. That the references is that we as followers of Christ, that we who are Christians, we who have been born again by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, The Bible tells us that we are to be then after we are saved. We are his vessels and we are his channels. And God wants to move through us so that we can be a blessing to somebody else that is maybe sitting beside us today or maybe somebody that lives beside us or somebody that we might confront in our daily activities. One of my very favorite scriptures that references this very fact is in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7. Paul says something like this. He said, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Did you hear it? Now, obviously, the earthen vessels that he's making reference to, that's us. We're made out of the dust of the ground. We're made out of the clay. And when he says, an earthen vessel, that's you and me. And then when he says, we have this treasure in an earthen vessel, he's talking about our wonderful salvation. He's talking about that when we became a child of God, that Jesus gave unto us this free gift of everlasting and eternal life. It's not something that we earn. It wasn't something that we could achieve, but it's by his grace. And when we got saved, God by his spirit, you know what he did? He came in and he entered into this earthen vessel of mine. And not only are these bodies the temple of the Holy Spirit, but we are the vessels of the Holy Spirit as well. And that's the treasure that we have inside of us. There's another one that's a favorite as well in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 21. 
Here Paul is giving us a listing of what it is to be a Christian. And in in chapter 2, he mentions several different analogies and illustrations of what it means. But one, he says, is we are a vessel. And if you want to be a vessel unto honor, He said, here's what you need to do. You need to purify yourself. And you need to become meat. That's King James, which simply means easily used. You need to become easily used or readily available to the Lord for every good work. That we are equipped for every good work. And so Paul says, as Christians, we are, we are vessels or we are channels of the living God. And we need to make ourselves available to him so that he can use us for every kind of good work that he wants to utilize us for. Then we find here the passage, which is our text. Jesus said that out of your innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. Speaking of the spirit which had not yet been poured out at the time he spoke it. But now you and I, uh, we don't have to worry about that because it, uh, the spirit's been poured out for over 2,000 years now. And if you look at the way that it is spoken back in the book of Acts, it it, it gives us a lead-in about some of the other things that transpire on the day of Pentecost. And they were in one accord, and the flames of fire that sat upon their head and the sound of a rushing mighty wind. But then it says this in verse 4, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So what, when you put these passages together in Acts chapter 2 and you put it together in what we've read in John chapter 7, Jesus is saying this, I want you to be my channel, to be my vessel. I want, first of all, there needs to be a constant inflow into your heart by the Holy Spirit. But there also needs to be this constant outflow that the Holy Spirit, that out of your innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. And so let me ask you that if God gives us all of these manifold blessings and good things and the touch of God that God gives to us, I want to tell us this morning that he didn't just give those to Rich Gold Eisen for Rich Gold Eisen. But he gives them to me so that I can become his channel and he can move through me and he can meet the need where the need is. It's, it's like a faucet and a hose and, you know, maybe your garden. Here you have these flowers and here you have these shrubs, these trees, and, 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 and what do you do? You know, here's, Eric said, is that your water? How do you like my water? See? See, we, we got the flow going here. All right. You know, now, now let me ask you something. One of the basic characteristics of water is that it seeks the line of least resistance. That means that it's going to flow downhill. And if the flow is here and it's poured out, and these flowers that are up here, how are you going to get the water up there unless you have a channel? How are you going to get it up there? You've got to have a channel. That's where the hose comes in. You see, you can turn it on there and have it running to you till you flood the place. But everything that's uphill is not going to get any of that water and it's going to funnel to the line of least resistance and so that's where this this hose and the and the water comes in let me turn it around this way see if the water doesn't fall out 
And you see, church, that's exactly how it is with you and me. That what you have here is you have the source of the flow, which is God and the Holy Spirit. Then you have individuals that are out there in the world, or maybe brothers and sisters, that they're in pain, they're in suffering, they have needs. And, and it is by God's design and God's purpose. Yeah, God can come down from heaven and he does do that. But basically the way that he has chosen to minister is through you and through me as the hose, as the channel. And when you do that, you can have a high concentration in in inundation of the presence and the power and the spirit of God right where you need it. You don't have to get approximate. You don't have to get uh, close by like a shotgun. But I mean, if you have the hose, you can get right to where the need is. We're asking ourselves today, where did the flow go? Where is the moving of the Holy Spirit? Where is the touch of Almighty God? If you have the source, if you have the suffering, and here is the supply. The suffering, it's not their problem. And let me tell you, it's not the source's problem. God has not changed. I believe Brother, Brother Hargrave, Brother Robert Hargrave told us that Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, and even though, yeah, he poured out his spirit over 2,000 years ago. And even though he died on a rugged cross and he rose from the dead. And now he's ascended into heaven. Although that has happened a long, long time ago. I'm here to tell us yet again that his power has not waned. His power has not diminished. His power has not uh, uh, been taken back in any form or fashion. It is just the same today as it was yesterday and it was when he first supplied and gave it to us. So then if it's not the source's fault and it's not the suffering's fault, then hmm... Must be this, must be this hose, Brother Terry. Must be this vessel. Must be this vessel. And so if the faucet's turned on and we're not getting anything out of there, we're going to have to uh, take some inventory of our lives. Church, we're living in the last days. I want to see South Roxana First Assembly of God be a Pentecostal church. I want to see the demonstration of the Holy Spirit in our midst. And so where did the flow go? Only you can answer that for yourself. Only I can answer that for myself. And so as we take inventory and as I, I look inwardly and I look at this vessel, the first thing that I need to ask myself, am I connected? You need to take a look and check the connection. If nothing's coming out of here, then you need to check over there. If there's nothing coming out of here, then I need to check in here. 
You know very well that a vessel that's not connected to the source is not going to do any good at all. You and I, we are vessels. If we're not connected, you know what? Brother Bill has a need. I can show up at Brother Bill, and here I am by myself in the flesh. And, and Brother Bill, I can point it and, and spew it out of my mouth and go through the, uh, the motions and all of that. But you know what? If you have a real need, you don't need a hose. You need the water. And what we've got a lot of times are hoses showing up. But what good is it if you're not connected? And so I want to ask us this morning, are you connected? Are you connected? First of all, are you a child of God? Are you saved? Have you come to him and said, Lord, I need you. I know that you are uh, the, the Savior, the Lord. I believe that God the Father by His Spirit has raised you from the dead. I repent of my sin. I'm telling you, it's as simple as that. If you mean it in your heart, then the Lord is going to connect you to the source, praise God. And so the question is, have you been connected? But you know what? That's not the only problems with connections with a hose. Because if the connection isn't tight up here, you know what happens? Instead of the water coming out here, the water's going to come out. Well, it won't stay there, but that's where it comes out. And you go about your business trying to minister to other people. And you don't have much supply coming out the end. In fact, most of it, as we said, is up here. And this is what you've got coming out here. Pitiful. Pitiful. I'm going to meet your need, Mike. Bless God, pastor's on the scene. Everything's all right. <laughs> you see, church, we're not just talking about regular water that spews everywhere if it's not tight or your uh, rubber washer in there is, is not good if you don't get a good connection. We're not just talking about water, but we're talking about God's grace, God's mercy, God's love, God's power, power to save, power to heal, power to deliver, power to meet every need. That's what we're talking about. And I'm telling you, in these last days in which we live, we need the full flow coming out of here. We don't need just a drop or a drip here and there. And most of it's just falling there on the ground because we don't have a good tight connection. You see, the, the people that are out here and the, where the needs are that we need to go to where they are, they need every drop. And if we're not tight... They're not going to get, we're going to lose more than we supply and allow the Spirit of God to flow through us. Now I want to ask you, are you and God tight? You know, we'll say, Brother Kevin and I, we're pretty tight. Brother Mike and Brother Bill, we're tight. What do you mean by that? We're close. And so I want to ask you, you may say, Pastor, I'm saved. That's not what I'm asking you. You may be connected, but are you tight? Are you close to the Lord? Or are you just taking your relationship with God as very casual? And, oh, it doesn't really mean that much. And, oh, it's not that important. I can do other stuff. And, and uh, you know, when I need God, I'll call upon him. 
Uh, if, if that's the type of relationship and we're not tightly connected through prayer and through the study of the word of God. And you know, I hear people even say that, that they don't like teaching. What? You don't like teaching? What is being taught? The word of God. I heard that when I came here. I don't like teaching. Okay, go ahead. You may be connected, but here's where most of the water is. And those out there that's hurting and dry and need something, this is all you're going to be able to supply, my little, my little. That's all. And maybe not even that. You see, church, I... My clock's up there, so I don't have a clue what time it is. So, <laughs> Did you notice in our text what the Bible said? And out of their belly or out of their innermost being, he didn't say shall flow a drop. He didn't say shall flow a drizzle. He didn't say shall flow a small stream. He didn't even say that it would be a river. But rather he said it would be rivers, plural. If you've ever been to a place, a confluence where several rivers or a couple of rivers come together, I would say that the volume is pretty high there. I would say that's not just a dribble coming out. That's not just a drop coming out. But I'd say that the full force of God's power is coming through the vessel the way he intended and the way that he wanted it to be. So I want to ask you, I want to ask me, where'd the flow go? Where'd the flow go? Where'd the flow go? There's something else we need to to look at. You say, okay, pastor, I'm, uh, I'm connected, I'm saved, and I believe I'm on there tight. But there's still not much coming out. Maybe we've got a clog in there. We need to check for clogging. You see, it doesn't matter whether it's your arteries whether it's a hose, whether it's a vessel, whether it's a channel, whether it's a ditch. Have you seen them out there with their big equipment, uh, uh, you know, various times cleaning out the ditches? You know why they do that, because they get clogged. And ditches, of course, it overruns and floods and destruction. Uh, But if it's in a confined space like this, it clogs it up. And even though you're connected, even though you're tight, it's still not coming through. You see, when it comes to connection, the problem there is sin. Because the writer said in Isaiah 59 and 2, he said, it is your iniquity that separates you. It's your sin that disconnects you, if you will. But whereas sin is is the problem with the connection when it comes to the problem of uh, of clogging you know what the what the uh, what the problem is there stuff stuff gets in there stuff gets in there do you ever have your water or your water to freeze you turn it on good connection, but it's not coming anywhere. Why? It's clogged. There's some stuff in there. And when I ask where did the power go or where did the flow go, I wonder if we're too clogged up with the stuff of this world. And instead of the pure, unadulterated, Holy Spirit flowing through us, 
there's more carnality. There's more flesh that's being spoken or being done because we're trying to make up for lack of the genuine thing. Church, once again, if I have a need or you have a need and, and the hose shows up, you don't need a hose, you need the water. And so even if I show up connected and, and there's stuff, I'm allowing the things of this world. And I don't have to get up and down and discuss and say, well, this is what it is or this is not what it is by the world or in the world. It can be anything, anything that I am allowing to come between me and God, then that is what is clogging my heart up and it means more to me than what God does. And when I do that, nothing coming out. Nothing coming out. Do you know that the, the best characteristic of a vessel or a channel is the best characteristic. Nothing. Amen. Nothing. Just like the best characteristic of the grave of Jesus Christ, the best characteristic is nothing. There's nothing there. And so the best characteristic of a vessel is that it's just a vessel. There's nothing there. Now, I don't know how you are. And, of course, when you stop by the drive through you know, you can get these uh, gallon drinks if you want, if you're into that. But it doesn't matter how much they say they're going to give you, how many ounces. They fill it full of ice. And by the time you get to what you have, it isn't very much. Because if you fill it with ice, then you can't get much of the real stuff, just like dinner and supper, is it pop or soda? So whatever it is, or tea, whatever you're drinking, and, and, and that is the idea here, is that in Peter, second, or second Timothy, chapter 2 and verse 21, that Paul says to Timothy, the young pastor, that you are a vessel and God wants to use you. But the very first thing that you need to do to be a vessel that is used of God is to purge yourself. <laughs> Clean it out. He said, be sanctified, set apart for God. And if you'll do that, then the flow will be unclogged. And you don't have to ask, where did the flow go? I got to move on. Say, Pastor, I'm connected, I'm connected tight, and I'm clean but there's still not much coming out. What could be the problem? Hmm. Not much coming out. Well, if we've checked the connection and we've checked for the clogging, maybe we need to check for cracking. You remember the old hoses, which are a lot better than these things. Now, I've not bought the real expensive one, but the ones you got buy at Walmart, uh, I just don't do it. They don't last very long. But the point of the matter is, is that if you've checked all of that, that you know that there can be dry rot. If something, if, if tires or rubber, a hose, if it's left out in the sun and it doesn't do anything and it just lies there, 
it'll dry rot and it will create cracks in the channel. And even though you're connected, even though you're not clogged, when you turn it on, you're still losing it through the cracks. The full flow. I know it's a different analogy, but the prophet Jeremiah said in chapter 2 and verse 13, he said, my people have, have committed two evils. First of all, they have forsaken the fountain, the living water of God. And then the second thing is they have hewn out for themselves cisterns. Places where they could collect water and store it. A fountain is constantly flowing. He said they have forsaken that. And, and now they're trying to do it on their own. And they have these cisterns. But, but he said not only do they have the cisterns and they have forsaken the source of the living water. But he said those, those cisterns, they are broken and they are cracked. And every little bit of water that they can muster up is going to leak out and it's going to be lost. The same thing with a, with a channel, with a vessel. You know, you would think that the more that you would be used, the sooner you would wear out. But in the philosophy and in the kingdom of God, the more you are used, the stronger you get. But there's people, we talked about it on Wednesday. Church is becoming very quickly a spectator sport. Nobody wants to be involved. Nobody wants to do anything. Nobody wants to take their time. Nobody wants to give their effort. Yeah, I'll show up. Well, then we need somebody here before the others show up. Well, count me out. And then we wonder why there's just a little bitty bit coming out. Because I believe spiritually we have dry rotted. Because of lack of use. And we've developed cracks. And even though we're connected, and even though we're clean, there's cracks that's letting out the precious flow and glory of Almighty God that this lost and dying world needs. There's one more thing. Say, Pastor, I'm connected. I'm clean. I don't see any cracks. I'm trying to be used. But I'm still not getting much out. We need to check for crimping where it crimps it shut. There is a word in the scriptures that means exactly to crimp or to, uh, to we would say, tie in a knot. And it's entangle. Paul says in Galatians 5.1, the Lord Jesus Christ has set you free by his grace. Now don't return and become entangled. Don't get tied up in a knot wherewith Christ has made you free. Don't become entangled again with the things of the world. Paul tells another analogy in 2 Timothy is not only are we vessels but we are soldiers. And he says there in 2 Timothy in chapter 2, and it's earlier on, I, I don't remember, it's, it's, uh, I've lost it. But, it. but it's in there, he says that a soldier, if you want to be pleasing to your high-ranking officer, 
The thing that you do is you do not entangle yourself with the things of this life. And so people get so tied up and tangled up in the stuff of this world. Did you ever go get your hose and you tie it up tightly and screw it up there, uh, connect it to the faucet? And it's the old kind that no matter how you tried to get it out and, 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 and uh, fold it up, not fold it up, but uh, wind it up, that inevitably if you just threw it down and hope that when you pulled on it and you needed it, that it was just going to unravel it doesn't do that. It doesn't matter. Brother, uh, brother so-and-so that used to preach for us, I'll just put it that way. He said, I always wondered how Houdini got in all those knots and all those things to try to get out. And he said, every year that I get my Christmas lights out, then I figure it out. They don't do anything. They just stick it in a box and leave it there for a year and get it out and there you have all those knots. And that's the way a hose is. And you know, you, 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 you pull on it. And when you pull on it and you're going around the side of the house, it gets in a knot or it crimps. And you know, the old hoses, you could bend them like that and cut the supply off. You could crimp them. And cut the supply off. Don't try that with these. My wife did that in kabooey. She had manifest hole in her hose. Church, our lack of faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the activities and the affairs of this world is worrying us sick and got us tied up in knots. And we wonder why when we come into the house of the Lord, where'd the flow go? Where'd the flow go? Let's get rid of these knots. Nona, would you help me here this morning? I'm, I'm finished. Church, it isn't us. But when a blessed major part of this church finds out he has cancer, we don't need hoses gathering around him. But we need vessels that's connected to the power and where the full flow of living water is able to lay hands on him. You're concerned and worried and frustrated about what's going on in your life and you're tied up in knots. You worry as you go to bed at night. It cuts off the supply. Entangles you. It's a trick of the devil. And I say you, me too. Or we get so caught up in things that aren't necessarily wrong, but but we make them wrong because we focus more on them than we do God and we get clogged up with life. We become so busy with life. And then we're so busy with life when we come home we just want to crash. I don't want to go to church on Sunday. That's my day of rest. I understand that if you work hard that you're tired but we can't just lay around and do nothing we're going to spiritually dry rot 
we got to be about our Father's business. So South Roxana First Assembly of God, I don't want us to just act like we're vessels of the Lord. I really want to be a vessel of the Lord. Stand with me if you would please.